Betsy, thanks for joining us. When people think of Betsy Andre, they think of someone who's raised her head up above the parapet and spoken out against doping. What was that experience like? It's been a roller coaster. There have been highs and lows, ups and downs. It was harrowing in the beginning when absolutely nobody believed me. There was no place for me to go. I couldn't go. There was no WADA. There was no dick pound. There was no place for me to turn. It was a very lonely, lonely place. And to go through all of that, you must have had a very strong sense of what was right and what was wrong. Where did that come from? You'd have to look at my childhood. Certainly, I have my sins and my proclivities. Um, but I was raised uh, in a family. My dad is an immigrant who has his own business, and people trusted him. He's a jeweler. So he always said, you have to be honest. You have to have integrity. Your reputation is very important. So that, along with other factors, made me the person that I am. What was it like to go through the Armstrong era and be subject to so much criticism publicly? It was awful because I knew I was telling the truth. I knew he was lying. I knew he was deceiving people on a scale that was absolutely unimaginable. And he was getting away with it. And yet the lie was being celebrated and the truth was being scorned. And that was really hard. And to go through all of that experience and have the strength of character, you mentioned you come from a religious background. Did you find yourself turning to religion to deal with that? I did. What's interesting is my dad is an atheist. My mom is a practicing Catholic, and my brothers and I were raised Catholic, and I could only rely on God. I couldn't rely on anybody else. And so I just I prayed and prayed and prayed that the truth, that the truth would come out. And... Eventually it did. And in the early years, there was obviously no WADA, there was no USADA, no one to really turn to. How did that feel? It was awful because I saw this massive deceit going on. I didn't like the fact that my husband had used DPO and there was no place for him to turn since he didn't like the doping. There was no place for me to go. So I had to be very, very careful, and I had to rely on a journalist, David Walsh, and he was the vehicle through which the truth came out. Had there been a WADA or USADA back then, everything would have been absolutely completely different. That's why it is so critical the mission of WADA and the mission of USADA. We need these because Cheating will never go away. We're always going to have somebody who's going to try to buck the system. And as long as we have WADA and USADA to keep that into check, there is hope. There is hope for the clean athlete who doesn't want to dope, for the child who wants to compete and not feel compelled to take the drug, for the parent to know that their child can truly compete on a level playing field. Let's fast forward a few years to when the USADA reason decision came out. What was your reaction? Initially, I thought, oh my gosh, I do not have time to deal with this because I have so much laundry to do. That's the truth. <laughs> but I, I was overwhelmed, and there was a sense of sadness that came upon me. And I said to Frankie, I'm supposed to feel elated, but I feel sad. And Frankie said, I don't. Cycling brought this on itself. You've talked before about the key to anti-doping being about preventing future generations, the athletes of tomorrow, from mm -hmm. even considering doping. Do you think that's the most important thing of focus for WADA, USADA, and other organizations? I think it would benefit WADA to have a program where parents of children can get involved because they don't know what WADA is. So by taking it to them and by saying, let's sign a pledge to compete with integrity, you have to educate younger. And when that comes from a parent, and then when it comes from an organization like WADA, whose mission is that every 
person, athlete, child, adult, can compete clean, that sends a very strong message. So I think that is that that along with the fact that we need high profile clean athletes to be vocal in their disdain for the sport, even if their peers who happen to be friends get caught cheating, there can be no tolerance. With WADA and USADA in existence, there can be zero tolerance for any doping in sport. You've dealt with a number of journalists over the years. What role do you think journalists can play in terms of holding athletes to account, athletes that are doping? We need journalists, good investigative journalists, who are not afraid to ask athletes the hard questions. And not just the athletes, but the federations and the governing bodies of those athletes, because they will keep them on their toes. And it's the journalists who will keep them in check, so they will know that the athletes will know they're, they're not going to be able to get away with it like they have in the past. Why do you think there aren't more Betsy Andreos in professional sport today? Who in the hell would want to go through what I went through? Who wants to be publicly excoriated in the media? Who wants to have their husband lose their job because they won't dope? Who wants to have their husband lose their job because their wife is a liability, like Frankie was told over and over again? I've had people come to me and apologize for not speaking out, but they said, we just didn't want to go through what you went through. If you could turn back the clock, would you go through all this again? If I could turn back the clock, I'd make sure that there was a WADA in USADA at the very beginning when I heard what I heard in October of 1996. Looking at cycling today in 2015, how much progress do you think has been made with anti-doping under Brian Cookson? Brian Cookson, I think, is a refreshing change. He's a man of integrity, but more has to be done. When we see that Astana has so many positives and yet they retain their license, it, people lose faith in the process. People lose faith in the governing body. So maybe rules have to be amended or bylaws have to be made to prevent this from happening because we always have to have the governing body believed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Some would say there's a conflict of interest between a governing body promoting its sport and also policing the sport, doing the testing. Cycling, would you agree, has made the right moves in having an independent testing agency. Would you say that's the right way to answer oh, that question? You have to have an independent testing agency because if you don't, it's the fox watching the hen house. And we know we can't trust the fox to watch the hens. So it, it is doing the right thing. You lived throughout that whole cycling era of doping issues. Mm -hmm. When you watch track and field today, do you see it as, as potentially going through the same problems? I think it's going through the same problems and maybe uh, even at a level that was even worse than cycling. Let me put it to you this way. Back in the late 90s, I was with another professional cyclist and track and field was on the TV and he made the comment, the average person thinks, wow, those guys run really fast. He said, the average athlete will think, wow, I wonder what they're on. Being an anti-doping crusader for so long, what have you learned through the experience? It is a long process. You have to trust the anti-doping agencies. You have to have people of integrity in there. You have to be tenacious and you have to be relentless and it's fighting the good fight, especially for the kids. What made you want to stand up for clean sport and speak out against doping? Doping is wrong. It's cheating. It's very unhealthy for your body, I believe. And what about the people who don't want to dope, who want to compete clean? So it was, it was wrong. It was wrong that uh, my husband got fired for not getting on a doping program. It was wrong that he even succumbed and that he did use EPO when he did it. To think that he was 29 years old when he had 
first used it because he thought he had to be on the team that he wanted to be on. It's just, it's it's sad. Had there been Awada or Usada, maybe that never we could have nipped it in the butt right away. It must have been very difficult during that whole era of swimming against this tidal wave of Lance mania. I mean, how did you cope with that? I always thought, maybe naively, that the truth was so important that it mattered, and once it got out there, everybody would believe me. However, being the mom of three young kids, it wasn't that easy. I was a stay-at-home mom competing with a an athlete who transcended his sport, became a celebrity, had a namesake charity, which purportedly did good for people who had cancer. He had his own doctors supporting him. He had a hospital supporting him. He had a perfect story because he was the comeback kid from cancer. He had adoring fans. He had sponsors who backed him regardless of any allegations. He had the media in his back pocket, more or less, who would just write just wonderful, adoring news about him. He had his own federation who didn't want to pursue, didn't want to investigate, didn't want to look into anything. He had the governing body, the UCI, one could argue, was complicit in helping propel the myth of the Armstrong, what was the Armstrong lie. I just had the truth. It was one person with the truth. And did you think in your heart of hearts that the truth would eventually come out? I thought that the truth would come out, but maybe 20 years from now. And then people would just shrug their shoulders and say, eh, athletes cheat, what are you gonna do? I never, in my wildest dreams, imagined it would, the downfall would be as swift as it's been. Do you feel vindicated by what's happened? Yes, I do. But the thing is, it's still not yet over. So when it's completely over, then the complete vindication will have come. Betsy Andrea, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm.